Ah, so today I'm speaking with Francisco Marmolejo, and uh, it's great to see you, Francisco. Great to see you. Well, well, since we saw each other, and you're now in Doha, in Qatar, having moved relatively recently from from India, and your job with the World Bank in India. So, like I moved uh, three months ago, uh, out of which I have been at home most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I don't know whether you've got much of a sense yet of what your new job is going to be like if you've been at home the whole time. But I, I wonder if you could just um, give me an idea what you, what you, this new role is, is going to be all about. Well, you know what? Uh, Qatar Foundation is a very unique uh, educational ecosystem. I think it is a very unique in the world that brings together from uh, kinder to doctoral education in one place in addition to a number of different entities uh, that all of those are sort of working towards the idea of how societies can transition into a knowledge-based uh, economy and society. So working at the foundation, being exposed to all those initiatives uh, and my role basically is to provide uh, advice to the, to the foundation on anything to do with education. Uh, it, it, it is enriching me, my, enriching my possibilities to continue learning about the complexities, but at the same time about the uh, opportunities that um, a, uh, you know, the interlock between education, innovation, community development, and health can make of a community much more uh, sort of striving, I might say. That sounds really fascinating. I'm sure you've got a lot to offer them. And uh, you can, it's, your, it's your first job, I think, in the Middle East. It is my first permanent job in the yeah. Middle East, yeah. is correct. Yeah. So I, I, what I'm, I'm very interested to ask you, Francisco, is that um, you've had a very varied career. Um, people will know you from many different roles that you've had. Um, but just to, just to take a very simple line, you've, you've worked within an institution and you've then worked in a regional organization like Connor Heck and, and many others. You've moved from that gradually to working for the World Bank in Washington and working for the World Bank in India. And each time, I think we know, um, as anybody moves into a, a more senior position, you get a different view of things and you get your helicopter vision becomes more developed, as it were. And I'm absolutely fascinated by your journey and how you've how you now perceive the field of international education, internationalization, having gone through all of those different stages? Well, you know, I think, first of all, it has been a fascinating road, uh, you know, travel, as you journey, as you say. It has been everything but boring. And, uh, and I think every, every day I find uh, a new opportunity to learn something new. And certainly, uh, you know, international education, it, it is... Uh, it is my, my field, I might say, you know, this is my passion. This is, I feel really strongly, you know, connected to the values and the, and the activities of what international education is about. Mm. But being said that, I, you know, when I was running Conahec, you know, 100% of my time was devoted to the idea of international education as the solution for everything. It was the kind of the panacea, you know, for everything we had the magic solution. Here we come, internationalization is the solution. Now I transitioned to the World Bank and then I started interacting with governments and with leaders of, uh, you, know, you know, ministries and, uh, and people, uh, you know, in, in, in national positions. And for them, internationalization meant something completely different. In fact, in many cases meant absolutely nothing or even in many cases meant a very negative uh, sort of perception of what internationalization is about. So I think... Uh, linking back to the sort of the colonialism that is sometimes... That's implied. correct. In many cases it's because of colonialism. In other cases it's because internationalization, as usually happens, it, it is being associated I think, just with the mobility of people. Yeah. Um, you know, in some countries it's been seen as a... Uh, you know, the whole idea of privatization, you know, with all the negative connotations associated with that, uh, these private providers coming and stealing our brains and stuff like that, um, or coming with uh, these uh, foreign ideas to change our values in our society. So there are many um, sort of negative perspectives that um, the general public, I might say, mm. or eventually 
the well-informed decision makers of governments have about what is internationalization and for which of course there is a lot of work to be done mm -hmm. in properly educating people of what is and what is not internationalization of uh, of higher education you know many times the perspective is that internationalization is a sort of the equivalent to elitism um, just the benefit for a few ones for the most privileged of our societies and that is also a very expensive proposition that the countries should devote resources and priorities to something that is much more um, you know important than just the idea of you know supporting someone to go abroad and spending a lot of money you know there are many of those things that also we need to deal with um, in uh, in uh, in conversations again with decision makers both at institutional but also at the at the national level and then finally uh, you know even though uh, the, the the coronavirus crisis is something that is very sort of unique but there is no doubt that the risk in a situation like this that we are living, is that as institutions will have to reevaluate, uh, that they will have to sort of reconsider what are their priorities and what are uh, their possibilities based on the, you know, obvious um, economic recession that the world is going to be living. Uh, of course, the risk of the internationalization effort to be either marginalized or being sort of shut down is very evident in many cases. But again, this is not just because this crisis. Every time that there is a crisis, there is always this risk of internationalization being lost. And one of the reasons for that, in my opinion, is because we, as a community of international education, have not been able yet to tell the right story about why it matters. Yeah. Uh, we have not been able to have adequate evidence of what it works, what it doesn't work, and why this is important for a better preparation of individuals for a different society that is going to be needed for the future. We're going to come back to that in a second, but one of the one of the ways in which we have tried to link to that is the is is linking internationalization with the sustainable development goals. And clearly, in terms of global efforts, for example, to combat pandemics or to deal with climate change or develop education and so on, we've got a very strong role to play. But now you've had a second to think about it. Can we go back to what you were saying about what how how can we better tell that story then? Well, the first thing we need to do and, and uh, is, is to build evidence. And, uh, you know, it is a little bit shameful, I might say, that uh, people working in international education, you know, all of them are properly prepared to do that. You know, you've received the training to do that. And universities, uh, higher education institutions are the best place to bring together the best experts in the local place and also internationally to build evidence of what it works, what it doesn't work. Still today, when we talk about internationalization, many times we based our assumptions just in anecdotes. And just in a few cases, uh, you know, efforts such as the one that you had been doing, Elspeth, in sort of building knowledge, bringing together scholars to, to build the body of knowledge on internationalization are extremely important. Mm -hmm. And at the institutional level, unless we build evidence, we won't be able to sustain our case. Unless we, in, we make the point that a more internationalized institution is an institution that is better serving to the needs of the local community, we won't make it. We won't survive. Unless we make that connection that you know, students who have that global mindset, whatever that means, are at the same time students which are more effectively connected mm -hmm. to the needs of the local community, we still, we are going to be seen like marginal or elitist in our approach to higher education. Of course, I completely agree with you. Um, but in, in many respects, so people in, who live in, say, the countries which are positive towards internationalization don't see those kind of threats you were talking about earlier. Many people in institutions are working with, within uh, an organization or indeed within a, a sort of a national context or regional context where mobility is 
synonymous really with internationalization and so many people who share the kind of values that you've just been expressing they're finding it very difficult to to step outside get their institution to step outside the evidence which is how many students have traveled abroad as part of their studies and the kind of very very simplistic quantitative side of evaluation mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. what can we do to what can we do to convince leaders to convince university leaders for example that this that these kind of values are, are very very important well i think the first thing uh I, elspeth and these days i have been in, in a lot of webinars talking about this and i keep making the case that uh, international educators should become activists of mm -hmm. international educators so if we are waiting for somebody else to speak on behalf of us, nobody will do it. If we are waiting for, I, and I'm saying, if we are waiting for our boss to defend our, you know, our office, our activity, most likely might not, might not be the case. You know, we should become the activists of uh, international education. We believe on that. And, uh, and I think what we need to do, first of all, is to, 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 to speak, to yeah. speak loudly about the importance of that. Secondly, again, we need to build the instruments and use the instruments to have the evidence of what we do, to show that internationalization is not only about moving people, it's not only about how many students we receive, how many students we send, or how many agreements or MOUs we have signed, but it's much more about the capacity that we embed in individuals in becoming integral citizens of our society and in becoming those individuals that are able to value what the world is but at the same time to value what their what the role in the in the local place is and of course you know that you know drawing that line or, or walking that line i would say walking that 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 stuff is is not an easy task um and that requires again you know sound evidence of uh to to to, to say that we are, I must say, better citizens of our society happen because internationalization of higher education, despite of internationalization of higher education or independently of internationalization of higher education. If we are unable to, to make that differentiation, we won't have the evidence to make the case. And of course, you're a great example of somebody who's been a, a fantastic activist you know you've, you've moved things forward you've you know developed things and so on and we all need to try and be much more like you francisco in that sense but just to just to uh, to round off the conversation um coming back to your your new role now then all of the all of that experience that you've gained going through those different phases of your life that you've articulated so clearly here do you think that it's kind of going to come together now or do you feel as though you'll be going having a, a slightly more limited phase now for a while no you know what uh, i always uh, you know there, there are many many uh, you know uh, again uh, the journey has been fascinating and i i con i continue to think that it will continue being fascinating for the future now the time that i working here at this foundation what i found extremely intriguing uh, at Qatar Foundation is that it is an organization that again has important global ambitions, but at the same time, very strong local commitments. It is an organization in which many of the things that I believe on about the ideal higher education come together to a place. Uh, it's a place, you know, always I have been a firm believer of the need of uh, adequate integration of the entire educational system. We cannot just work in higher education, basic education, middle education, and silos. Uh, so we hear at the Qatar Foundation, the big advantage is that we have the whole spectrum of the entire educational system. So we have no excuse no. In, 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 a, you know, in, again, doing the job of education more effectively. Now, it is a place in which also converge a, a number of well-recognized universities, which are part of the edu you know, education city. You have Texas A&M, Carnegie Mellon, uh, yeah, you know, HEC, and many number of global universities being established in Qatar, doing a service to both the local and the international community. And also you have the home ground university, HBKU. So again, um, uh, and when you add that to the whole work in health, the whole working community, this is a place where I say, wow, you know, it is possible to, 
to have something like that. Now, people may argue, well, this can happen there because Qatar is a country that has a lot of money. Immediately, some of those assumptions are there. Uh, for sure, you know, it shows that when a society decides to invest in education, results can be there. But that applies to any other context, to any other country in which one's commitment towards education is in place and towards an integral concept of education, community development, health is there. Of course, a society can be better off. So this is a time in which now I can see in practice some of the crazy ideas that I have been sort of learning about uh, in my life. And I hope that that experience also later in my life can be used in other contexts as well. Well, it sounds really fascinating and thanks very much for talking about it today. Uh, I really, it's always, always enjoyable to, to talk with you and I look forward to seeing you again soon, Francisco. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. <laughs> Great.